Hello and God bless you. I'm Cassandra Hill from Mount Sinai Deliverance Missionary Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois, with the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, June the 16th, 2024. And this is lesson number three of the summer quarters. And our lessons come from the Union Gospel Press Christian Life Series Books. Once again, I greet everyone with hello and God bless you. I pray that all is well with you and your family, that you've had a blessed week and that you're ready for this week's overview of the Sunday School lesson. Uh, we have been really having some wonderful lessons. We're just off to the start of our summer quarter, and I know that uh, we're going to have more great lessons to come, and we're going to get into today's lesson. But of course, we first want to come before the Lord in prayer. We always want to acknowledge the Lord and whatever we endeavor to do for Him. So at this time, I'm asking that you would all pray along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus, Lord, just to tell you thank you. Father, we thank you for another opportunity and another chance to study your word. We're so grateful that you have given us your word. And we just ask that as we study today, that Holy Spirit will open our understanding and help us to receive what you have for us in your word today. Father, I just lift up everyone that is watching this video, every household that is represented. Father, I pray your blessing and your peace on that house today. Father, we lift up those that are going through a time of bereavement. We ask that you send comfort and peace to their hearts and to their minds today. Strengthen them where they have been weakened and build them up where they have been torn down, Father, and enable them to continue on in life, Father, and to carry on the things that you have for them to do. And dear Heavenly Father, we lift up those that are going through a time of sickness, whether it's in the, a sickness in the body or in the mind. Father, we know that you are the great physician. And we're just asking that you allow your healing virtue to flow to the point of the need and heal today in the name of Jesus, Father, so that someone will have a, a testimony of the healing power of the Lord. And then Heavenly Father, we know that there are others that are going through other situations and circumstances, Father, but we know that you're able, you're more than able to meet every need. Father, we just thank you for it right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, because you have been so good to us down through the years, over and over. You have been better to us than we have been to ourselves. And we appreciate you today, dear Heavenly Father. We ask right now that this Sunday school lesson will be a blessing to the hearers. And Father, we pray for those that have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you touch and that you would draw because we know that's your will, Father. That's your desire that none be lost, but that all would come to repentance. And we know that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. He was lifted out of the earth, out of the grave, so that men may be saved. And so we just pray right now for your will to be done. And again, we thank you for everything that you've done. We believe you for what we are yet waiting to be manifested in our lives. We count them already done in Jesus' name. And it is in his name that we pray. Thank God and amen. Once again, we're so delighted to be able to present the Sunday School lesson overview for this week. And we are continuing in our study of women of faith. And so far we have talked about Eve, the first woman that God created. In that lesson, that first lesson, we saw how women have been a part of God's plan for humanity from the beginning. We also saw a glimpse of God's plan of redemption when God presented Eve to Adam. This represented the institution of marriage. And this union between man and woman is symbolic of the relationship of Christ and the church. Then last week, we studied the story of Deborah. Not only was Deborah a prophetess, she was also a judge of Israel. And by the leading of the Lord God, Deborah encouraged Barak to move forward with the command that God had given him to confront the army of Israel's oppressors. Not only that, but Deborah accompanied Barak to the battle where Barak and the men of Israel saw an overwhelming victory, just as God had promised. It was Deborah's courage and her obedience to the voice of the Lord that helped, is, that helped free Israel 
from 20 years of oppression. Now, today, we will begin the first of two lessons that focus on Ruth, the Moabite widow who remained faithful to her aging Israelite mother-in-law, Naomi. Her faithfulness and obedience to Naomi led Ruth to become part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. And that takes us to the subject of today's lesson, which is Ruth follows Naomi. Our lesson text for today comes from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, verses 14 and 16. Our related scriptures are Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 19, and Matthew chapter 19, verses 27 through 30. The time is between 1130 and 1120 BC, and the place is Moab. Today's golden text reads, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. This comes from Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 16. Today's aim is to show how one young woman from Moab found refuge in a family who knew the true God. To affirm that our families can be places of refuge and safety if we follow God's order for them. And to show how we can make our families places of community when we leave behind our old life and choose to follow Christ. Now we begin our reading today from Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 1. And it reads, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his sons, Malon and Chilion. Epaphrodites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Amen. Um, now, uh, the book of Ruth does not specify its author, but tradition holds that the book was written by the prophet Samuel. And I read that the book of Ruth was originally part of the book of Judges, where we studied from last week. And we mentioned last week that the prophet Samuel is also believed to have written the book of Judges. So the, the uh, fact or, or the, the claim that Ruth was originally part of the book of Judges perhaps supports that the prophet Samuel is the author of the book of Ruth as well. In any case, we um, see several themes in the book of Ruth. We see family, we see tragedy, suffering, love, kindness, compromise, faith, and obedience. And at the end, we could say we also see a um, restoration, if you will. Amen. But we also see uh, the mercy of God and how God extends mercy to those who are merciful. That's something very important to keep in mind, that God extends mercy to those who are merciful. And we start our lesson today at the first verse of the book of Ruth, Ruth 1 and 1. And it tells us the timing of when the events uh, which are recorded in the book of Ruth takes place. It was during the time when the judges ruled. We see that in verse number one. And we talked last week about 
how after Moses and Joshua died, the tribes of Israel did not have a central leader. Uh, the, the individual tribes kind of did their own uh, little things, so to speak. Amen. Uh, the people strayed from God and they strayed from God's commands. And God chastised them by allowing their enemies to invade them. And, you know, we talked about this last week, so I won't get into a whole lot. But somebody may say, well, why is God so uh, he chastising them? So, well, he God had a plan for the redemption of mankind to come through these people. Jesus was going to come through these people, this lineage. So um, it was important that they obey God and keep his commands because they would be uh, known as his people. Amen. So um, when, when the people would disobey God and stray away from God, God had to allow them to be chastised by their enemies. The uh, people of God, the Israelites, would cry out to God for help. And God would then raise up a leader. He would raise up a judge who he would give instructions to, to lead his people out of their troubles and back to himself, lead them back to God. This was a cycle that was repeated over and over and it often involved warfare. And we talked about a case last week with Deborah. That was a case that involved warfare. However, at this point in time, as we are starting the book of Ruth, it appears that warfare is not an issue for Israel. Instead, we see that there is a famine in the land. There's a famine in Bethlehem. And this is ironic because Bethlehem means the house of bread. Amen. So we are not told the cause or nor the extent of the famine. We don't know if this was a result of a, uh, of a war because we, like I said, um, Israel was involved with a lot of, in a lot of warfare at that time. So we don't know if the famine was due to the damage of the land due to war or was this another punishment that the people were suffering for their disobedience? We also don't know how much of the land was impacted, but apparently it affected Bethlehem. Amen. And it's, it's something here um, in this first verse. This this is uh, this area is called Bethlehem, Judah. Amen. And and and, and I, I looked at that, and um, the author specified this as Bethlehem, Judah, because there was another place called Bethlehem. So we were, uh, they were, uh, the author is uh, distinguishing it was this particular area. You know, it's just like in our day today, uh, we have cities across the country that have the same name. And sometimes you may specify the state to uh, uh, designate this is the particular city I'm talking about. I'm thinking in particular of the city of Memphis. Now, most people are familiar with Memphis, Tennessee. Amen. But I also saw that there is a Memphis in Alabama and that there's a Memphis in Florida. There's a Memphis in Indiana and in Michigan. So um, normally when you say Memphis, people's mind would go to Tennessee. But if you're talking about one of these other places, then you would need to specify the state that you are referring to. So this is kind of what's going on here. That it's Bethlehem um, that that that's being referred to. The Bethlehem that we would we be familiar with. Amen. So anyway, um, there was a famine going on, and apparently there was no relief in sight from the famine. So we see that there's a man from Bethlehem, Judah, an Israelite. Amen. He leaves Bethlehem, taking his wife and their two sons into uh, the city of Moab, or that area, that region, amen? So now Moab, um, it's important to know that it was uh, noted for its rich and fertile uh, pastures and farmland. The land uh, in Moab was great for growing crops and raising livestock. And apparently the famine had not impacted that area. One commentator pointed out that the land 
and the beautiful uh, mountains of Moab was visible from the Mount of Olives and in the higher points and the higher places in Bethlehem. And Moab was not that far away from Bethlehem. So we can imagine that the man could see over in this other region that they were doing pretty well over there. Amen. And to the man, it no doubt looked like a good place to take his family to ride out this famine. Amen. So the scripture says that the man and his family, they went uh, to sojourn in the country of Moab. Amen. So um, that word sojourn, that has a connotation that this man and his family were going to a place where they would be considered strangers or foreigners. And uh, it was a strange land, not only because it was not their home, but also the people of Moab, the Moabites, did not serve the Lord God. And their worship of their false, and sometimes when the uh, Bible is uh, talking about a false God, it, it, it's referred to as a strange God. <laughs> Amen. Because he's strange from what God's people were used to. Amen. And, and what they knew. Amen. So this strange God, uh, this was an abomination uh, to the Lord God. The way they worship, their practices in worshiping this God of uh, Moab, the Moabite God. It was an abomination to God. So we read later in scripture amen, at some time past, amen, that the worship of this Moabite God, among other gods, was the reason that the Lord God took most of the kingdom from King Solomon. And we know King Solomon, that was King David's son. God had made uh, David a promise that his uh, kingdom would, have, would go on forever because Jesus was coming through that lineage. Amen. So um, we have had lessons and we talked about how this king, he was over all of Israel, but he was stripped down to just a small portion because of his worship of these idol gods. So I said all that to say God was not pleased with this idol worship, but this is where Imelech is taking his family. They're going to a place that looks good because, it, it, like I said, it was good for growing crops. And it, it looked good, especially with uh, Israel, uh, uh, that portion of Israel, or maybe all of Israel, going through that famine. Amen. This place looked like a good place, but evil was taking place there. Amen. So from this, we can see that everything that looks good is not necessarily good. Amen. So this word sojourn, I want to talk about this a little bit more. It also denotes a temporary stay. Amen. So from this, we can infer that the man had every intention of just staying there with his family until the famine in his homeland had passed. Amen. And then I'm sure he was intending to come back home. Amen. I, when I said that, I thought about the movie that said there's no place like home. Amen. So I'm sure he wanted to go home, it, it come back home. Amen. But it was just that home was going through some difficulty. And in verse number two, we see the names of this man and his family. Amen. We see um, um, the names here. And, I, and you know, we had mentioned before how um, in Bible times, uh, biblical times, the, your name carried a meaning. It was significant as to what you were named. Your name often uh, spoke about your character. Amen. So here in our textbook, it says the head of the household was uh, Imelech. Amen. Whose name means my God is king. His wife was Naomi whose name means pleasant or delightful. The names of their two sons may hint at physical problems. Malon, that means weak or uh, sickly. And Chilion means wasting or pining. 
Uh, okay, so the, we see the names here, and these names just give us something, to, uh, tell us a little something more about these people. Amen. And when you look at the scripture, it says that they, they were Epaphrodites. They, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, of Bethlehem, Judah. And our textbook tells us that uh, e Erath, amen, uh, I may be not pronouncing it correctly, please forgive me. It said this was the original name for Bethlehem. Thus, an Epaphrodite was simply an inhabitant of Bethlehem though this older designation may indicate that they were descendants of one of the older established families of the area. Amen. So this is another name for um, that the, the they were from Bethlehem. Bethlehemites, I guess you could say. Amen. But like our textbook said, they were probably more one of the more established families. Amen. So then we read on at the end of uh, verse number two, that they came into the country of Moab. So they arrived in Moab. Amen. And, and that's where they settled there. They continued there. So they settled in Moab. Now, I, I pointed out the fact that this place was not, this was a, an ungodly place, or un, I should say ungodly practices were taking place in uh uh, in that place, they were uh, there were ungodly practices going forth there. Now, one may ask if a man, if that man was wrong to tell, move his family into an idolatrous place to avoid this famine. Amen. Well, the scripture does not give a judgment on this. It doesn't say he was wrong. It doesn't say he was right. It doesn't give any judgment at all. So in a case like that, we should refrain from making a judgment. Amen. If God didn't say he did wrong or if God didn't say he did right in his word, then we don't have to have a, an opinion about it. Amen. It just is what it is. He moved his family there. Amen. That's what we see. Amen. Okay. We're going to pick up now with verse number three. It reads, And Emelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Amen. Now, the family had escaped um, the famine, but they faced a tragedy. The husband died while they were in Moab. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it was no doubt his intention to return to his homeland after the famine. But uh, we see that he didn't make it back. Then that just shows us that we as human beings, we may have our plans on what we're going to do in the future. But only God knows whether they're going to come to fruition or not. Amen. So we, it, it pays for us to stay in the will of God, uh, to in, 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 let, let that be our intention, to find ourselves in the will of God. Amen. Because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And we are not told how long after the family arrived in Moab that the husband and the, and the father, Imelech, died. We do know, however, that the death of the head of the household can be devastating. And we see this indicated by the words that Naomi and her two sons were left. Amen. In those times, a woman without a spouse could be in jeopardy of losing all her financial support. But fortunately, um, she had two sons and it appears that they were of age where they could provide financially for her. So that was a blessing. And our textbook points out that perhaps this would have been a good time for the family to head back home so that they could receive support from their extended family and friends from their community. But instead the family deepened their roots 
in Moab by staying, and the sons married Moabite women, namely Orpah and Ruth. And we learn later in the book that Ruth was married to the brother named Malon. Amen. And we see, interesting that um, they made this choice, uh, but I guess they were in Moab. Amen. So uh, that was probably the uh, most convenient thing for them to do would be to marry a woman that was in the land that they were in. Amen. And we uh, see several places in scripture where intermarriage and intermingling uh, with the Moabites was forbidden by the Lord God. He gave instruction to not do that. The reason being that the Moabites worshiped a false God and they would draw their Israelite spouse back from the Lord God to their false God. This is what God warned them. This is what would happen that you will be drawn back. And that's why he forbid them to intermingle and to learn their ways. He didn't want them to know anything about those false gods. And the scripture goes on to say that Naomi and her sons continued to live in Moab for about 10 years. And we don't know if this is 10 years um, from the time that they at first arrived in Moab or 10 years after the father died, or 10 years after the sons married. We don't know, but we know they were there at least for 10 years. And uh, in any case, um, the little sojourn <laughs> to Moab that they were taking, that little temporary trip that we mentioned back when we were looking at verse number one, it now seems to have turned into more of a permanent residence for them. Amen. So we're going to go on now, pick up a verse number five. It says, and Malon and Chilion died also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Oh my. Okay. We have another tragedy in the family. We are not told how this happened. Did the um, brothers, did the sons of Naomi die at the same time? Or if they didn't, how far apart did they die? And how close in proximity to their father's death did their deaths occur? We don't know the answer to these questions here. This scripture doesn't tell us. But both of Naomi's sons died leaving now behind three widows. Amen. Three women without financial support. You know, um, I guess the, uh, I was thinking back when we talked about the, the meaning of these names, we saw that there could have been, they could have had some physical problems. Amen. So maybe that was, uh, um, that contributed to their passing. We don't know. But these women are without financial support. The young women, um, they could possibly uh, have an opportunity to remarry because it sounds like they're still pretty young. They don't have any children here mentioned. Uh, but we know at Naomi's age, that would uh, be highly unlikely for her to marry again. And with no income, uh, no husband to support her, no sons to support her. Naomi was facing a life of poverty. And in addition to that, with her sons now dead uh, and with no possibility of having more sons in her old age, the family name would not be carried on. And, uh, but the worst of all, uh, is the grief, the grief that these three women are suffering. The younger women were experiencing the loss of a husband. And I'm sure it wasn't their expectation to be young widows. I'm sure when they married, they expected to be married until their old age. But uh, Naomi, she was experiencing the loss of, of her sons. And I've heard it said that regardless of the age, the loss of 
one's child carries a distinct type of grief and trauma. So this is a really sad situation here. And um, here in our textbook, it reads, with the utter hopelessness of her situation, uh, must have come questions. Was there any meaning in this? Why did God allow this to happen? Was she in any way responsible for all this? I'm sure we have all been in situations when we had to question why. Why is this happening? What, what's going on here? What does this mean? This is where uh, Naomi was. Amen. She, she didn't understand and she felt, as our textbook says, she felt a sense of utter hopelessness. First, her husband and now her sons are gone. And even if you look at it before then, she had to leave her home. That probably wasn't a pleasant thing to have to leave your home. Amen. But she had to leave her home and over looking for something better. And over there, she found nothing but grief, uh, the loss of her husband and now the loss of her two sons. Okay, we're going to pick on up with uh, verse number six. It reads, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Amen. Well, after hearing of Naomi's sad plight, we get a bit of good news. In verse number six, we see that the Lord had visited his people, amen, in giving them bread. Amen. The, the uh, uh, God in his mercy had lifted the famine in Judah. And hearing this good news, Naomi decided to return back to her homeland because Moab had nothing left to offer her. She would be better off to go and live among her relatives in Bethlehem. And that's what she decided to do. So as Naomi began to make her way to her homeland, her daughters-in-law followed her. They no doubt felt obligated to follow Naomi and to help take care of her. They had been with her since they had married her sons. And they had, to some degree, they had broken ties with their natural families when they married these Israelite men. So they identified more with Naomi at this time. And apparently there was a bond of love between Naomi and her daughters-in-law, so much so that they were willing to leave their native land and their culture to go with Naomi. They didn't want Naomi to face the future all by herself. Our textbook tells us their affection speaks well of their character. It also speaks well of Naomi, whose godly virtues had attracted such loyalty. Here then were three women united by a common grief and facing an uncertain future, but they determined to face it together. Amen. Oh, this is so beautiful. You know, a lot of times uh, women are portrayed as being catty and not being able to get along with one another. And uh, a lot of times the uh, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law um, relationship is often portrayed as one that's, um, um, well, uh, how I say it, it can be adversarial when it should not be. This is a beautiful example here of a loving relationship between the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law. I think it's uh, a great example for us today to strive for. And we, as our textbook is pointing out, one of the things that helped facilitate this loving bond was Naomi's godly virtues. Amen. We, we, it's so important. You know, a lot of people, you know, you know, don't seem to care very much, you know, uh, 
about how people care about them or what they think about them. But it's important. A good name, the Bible tells us, a good name is rather than to be chosen than riches. Amen. So it is important for us to display godly uh, virtues. And it is important what people think about us. As long as if they have a negative opinion, it's not because of something that we have done to give them that negative opinion. Amen. It's their own, you know, de decision to, to uh, feel that way. Amen. But we see here that this wasn't the case with Naomi. She had displayed godly character and godly virtues in front of these young women, so much so that they wanted to follow her as she went on um, back to her homeland. Amen. Okay, now we're going to pick up here with verse number eight. It reads, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Hey Amen. Now I can imagine that um, the prospect of facing the future without immediate family was not something that Naomi was looking forward to. Um, that could be a little scary. It could be a little frightening. But she put the welfare of her daughters-in-law above her personal concerns. They were still young women. They could remarry and they could have children. The prospects of them finding husbands in Israel, however, would be slim due to them being Moabites. Now, the gentleman had uh, a choice between an Israelite young lady and these Moabite ladies, they would no doubt choose the Israelite uh, young lady. Amen. Uh, so uh, Naomi told her daughters-in-law to return to their mother's house. And our uh, textbook here um, explains this mother's house. Amen. Mother's house is referring to the women's quarters of their homes. There, their mothers could comfort them and they could prepare them for another marriage. Amen. She wanted to put them back in the hands of their mothers who could get them ready to be remarried again. Amen. So Naomi acknowledged the kindness that her daughters-in-law showed her and her sons and prayed that God would bless them for it, for the kindness that they show. Amen. I'm telling you, this is, we could take a lot out of this. Amen. Um, how important it is um, to be kind. Amen. These young women, uh, we talked about Naomi's character, but they had a good character too. They were kind to their mother-in-law, but moreover, Naomi points out that they were kind to their husbands. Amen. How they, she said, um, pray that the Lord will bless them, uh, deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead. What they're talking about her husbands and maybe even her father. Well, they didn't know the father-in-law, but um, I would say we don't know that they knew the father-in-law because it mentions that they were married after he died. Amen. We don't know that much, but apparently that they were kind and loving to their husbands. What a good name for a wife. Amen. To be noted as being kind and loving to her husband. Amen. So our textbook mentions how interesting it is uh, that Ruth invoked blessing from the Lord God. And from not uh, not from the false god of Moab, because remember these ladies are Moabites. Amen. She didn't try to bless them uh, uh, using the name of their god, but the Lord God is uh, where she prayed that they would be blessed and that would bless her, bless these women. Although um, Naomi had been away from Bethlehem for at least ten years, we know she was in Moab 
for at least 10 years. She had apparently held firm to her faith and had no doubt shared her beliefs with her daughters-in-law, as we mentioned earlier. Our textbook uh, speaks more about the prayer that uh, Naomi prayed here in verse number eight. It tells us in using the expression deal kindly or show kindness um, in verse number eight, Naomi used the Hebrew word that refers to the loyal love established by a covenant. It is often used to describe God's covenant dealings with Israel. But here she prayed that he might extend this covenant love to foreigners as well. She had seen evidence of the same kindness in them, which they had displayed to their husbands and to her. Amen. Because of this, she prayed that the Lord God would show them that same kindness. And then in verse number nine, Naomi prays again for God's blessings on these young women. She prays that they find rest in the house of their husbands. So first of all, and here she's praying that they would find a husband, that they would remarry. And um, some, you know, in our day today, you know, women have more um, opportunities um, to, 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 to live the, uh, uh, the life that they want to live. You can go, go to school and uh, get your education and you can get a job and you can take care of yourself. You can make money as a female. They didn't have those opportunities back in that time. So in that culture, matrimony, in that culture and in that time, matrimony was a desire for most women. Amen. So this prayer that she's praying for them, this is really a special blessing that she's praying would come their way. Amen. Naomi uh, prayed that they would find rest. Amen. This rest means security. She wanted them to be well taken care of. Amen. Now here in our textbook, it says in their case, it meant uh, this rest meant a release from the worries and troubles their widowhood would bring. Amen. She wanted the best for them. She was praying that God would bless them with, with, with what would be best for them. Amen. What a beautiful prayer. And then Naomi followed this prayer with what she thought would be a parting kiss. Amen. She kissed the daughters-in-law. Amen. She was kissing them goodbye because she wasn't expecting to see them again. Amen. But this just stirred up the emotions of the young women. And in uh, verse number nine, we read that they uh, lifted up their voice and they wept. Amen. They, they, they didn't want to leave Naomi. Amen and amen. Okay, we're going to skip a few verses now and we're going to verse number 14. Now, our textbook emphasizes the second half of verse number 14, but I'm going to read all of it. It says, and they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Amen. Now, verses 10 through 13 are not included in our lesson. And, but if you read these verses, um, you'll see that the young women insisted that Naomi allowed them to go with her. But Naomi reasoned with them, telling them that she didn't have any other sons that they could marry. In other words, Naomi was telling the young ladies that she didn't have anything to offer them. Why should they stay with her? Someone who the Lord God had punished. This is what uh, Naomi said. Uh, this shows how Naomi felt, that as if she had been punished by God. Now, Naomi couldn't see the future. She didn't know that God had a great blessing on the way for her. But right then at that point, she felt as if she was being punished by God. And there was no reason for the young ladies to um, follow her any longer. 
Uh, but with this appeal, one of the daughter-in-laws, Orpah, she kissed Naomi goodbye and turned to head back to her family. No doubt what Naomi had said made sense to her. If she ever wanted to remarry and have a family of her own, this would be her opportunity now for a new life. And uh, apparently being a wife and possibly a mother was a desire of hers. And we can't think harshly of her for that. You know, people have to be allowed to make what they feel are the best decisions for their lives. And we are to respect that. And that is what Orpah did. She thought it would be, she listened to her mother-in-law. She took that uh, sage advice and she said, well, this is my opportunity to start over. So I'm going to take this opportunity. And it shows the unselfishness and the strength that Naomi had to release these young women, even if it meant that she would possibly be alone. Amen. But the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, she, the Bible says she clave to Naomi. She clave to her. Amen. She had considered her options just as Orpah had, but she came to a different decision than her sister-in-law. In our textbook, it says that uh, her life, speaking of Ruth, her life would henceforth be with Naomi. Whatever the sacrifice, the Hebrew term for cleave indicates the closest possible loyalty and affection. It is the word used to describe the ideal relationship between husband and wife. Ruth's identity would be tied to Naomi. Amen. So she would become like Naomi's daughter. It's, it's as close as they could get. Amen. She was making a uh, she was making a decision. She was making a a a a, a, a loyal uh, decision to stick with her mother-in-law. Amen. And now, okay, we're going down to uh, verse number 16. It reads, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Amen. Now, we didn't read verse number 15. We skipped that verse. But in verse number 15, Naomi tries once again to convince Ruth to return to her family, mentioning how Orpah had returned to her people and their gods and that she should do the same. Now, spiritually speaking, this was not good advice for Ruth to return to those false gods. But we understand that Naomi wasn't thinking spiritually. She was only thinking of this physical life, the life that um, uh, Ruth could enjoy with a new husband and with children. So um, she wasn't thinking spiritually. But here in verse number 16, Ruth begged Naomi to stop asking her to leave and to return to her family. She pledged to go wherever Naomi went and to lodge, or in other words, to live wherever Naomi lived. And then she went one step further. She said, uh, she pledged that Naomi's people would be her people. She would no longer consider herself to be a Moabite. She would identify herself with Naomi's people and Naomi's customs and their law, their, the, uh, the, the customs and the laws, I should say, of the Israelites. Amen. And this included her spiritual identity. She declared that Naomi's God would be her God. She uh, had decided to trust in the Lord God that Naomi served and that she talked about. And Ruth decided to serve him and to worship him as well. 
Apparently, the example of faith that Ruth had seen in Naomi had, and, and, and in her sons had made an impression on Ruth, so much so that she wanted to be part of that community of faith. She wanted to be one of the Israelites. Ruth's faith in God had been ignited by the example that she saw in Naomi and the love that they shared for one another. If we read further in verse number 17, which is outside of our lesson, because verse number 16 is the last verse for today. But if we look at verse 17, we see that Ruth pledged to stay with Naomi until they are parted by death. And then she wanted to be buried wherever Naomi was buried. That's a bond. That's a very strong bond. Amen. Ruth uh, concluded her pledge to Naomi with a solemn oath to the Lord God. Amen. You can read about that. Amen. If you read uh, on verses uh, 17 and on. Amen. So when we look at the subject of our lesson today, our subject was Ruth follows Naomi. Amen. And we saw that Ruth not only followed Naomi to Bethlehem, but she followed Naomi to the Lord, to faith in God. Amen. This shows us that living out our faith and our behavior towards others can help influence and lead people to Christ. And that's what we all should want as Christians. That should be our uh, goal to win a soul to Christ. And we see that it is possible. Amen. It's possible as we live out our faith and it's possible in the way we treat our fellow man, that we can lead someone to Christ. Amen. I'm telling you, I, as I'm reading that, that just shows me, sometimes it's it's not all in the, the, the how many scriptures you know and how many scriptures you can quote, you know, to somebody. So it's just in the life that you live. Amen. Because you can quote scripture all day, but if you don't live the life, amen, you're not going to be able to draw anyone to Christ. If you're not kind to people, you're not going to be able to draw anyone to Christ. Amen. So we see here, it's not always in the, um, in the, in, in, in the, in what you can do in, in, you know, how many scriptures, like I said, you know, and how many you can quote and how long you can pray and how impressive you can be in that way. Amen. People are more impressed by what you do, not by what you say. Amen. And the example that you live before them. And this is what we saw with Naomi and Ruth today. Amen. Okay. At this time, I want to read our conclusion. Amen. As we are at the end of the lesson, our conclusion states that there is a wonderful lesson for all of us here. We were once outside the realm of God's kingdom, but through his grace, he has invited us back inside its borders where we are now part of his family. We did not deserve it, but God in his mercy forgave our sins in Christ and made us his very own. Just as Ruth found a new family with her mother-in-law, Naomi, so we have found a new home in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. It is now our calling to help others find new community in the family of God. When God becomes our heavenly father, we are brought into a new relationship with all others who love him. People in some other religions have no concept of the fatherhood of God, but it is vital for us as Christian believers. Amen and amen. I hope we have all gotten something wonderful out of today's lesson. So many wonderful little nuggets in the lesson. So I know that as we um, do our own study and review, we'll be able to pull out these lessons and apply them. I mean, pull out these nuggets in the lesson and apply them to our own lives. At this time, we're going to read our practical points. Practical point number one reads, God's people are not automatically exempt from the difficulties of life. This comes from Ruth chapter one, verses one and two. Number two, sometimes 
God chooses to allow circumstances that leave him as our only hope. This comes from verses three through five. Number three, the wise person recognizes that every good thing is from God. This is coming from Ruth chapter one, verse number six. We have a reference to Matthew chapter five and verse 45 and from James chapter one and 17. Number four, no matter how difficult or how uncertain the outcome, take the next biblical step. This comes from Ruth chapter one and verse number seven. Number five, our own difficulties should never preclude our desire for God's blessings on others. This comes from verses eight and nine. And number six, following God involves sacrifice, but also the hope of his sure provision. This comes from verses 14 and 16. Now we have some questions here for research and discussion. I do encourage us to take a look at these questions. I'm sure they will help us to get an even deeper insight into today's lesson. And now we have the subject for next week's lesson, Ruth meets Boaz. And this comes from Ruth chapter two, verses eight through 18. And we also have some related scriptures there that we can take note of. Amen. Now at this time, I would like to speak to anyone who has not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I want to offer you an invitation to do just that, to come to Jesus. And I want to offer you that invitation using the words of Christ that he spoke and that are recorded in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. John chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes on to state, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That right there, that's just a summary of God's plan of salvation for mankind. God knew that man needed a savior and he sent his only begotten son into the world, his son, Jesus. And Jesus came, Jesus lived and he gave his life. He shed his precious blood on Calvary's cross. He was buried in the tomb. For three days, he stayed there. And then on the third day, Father God raised him up out of that grave with all power in his hand. Amen. He had taken the sin of humanity. Now it's up to us to come and to receive what the Lord has done on our behalf. We can just simply repent of our sin and ask the Lord to save us today. Acknowledge what he has done, that he is Lord. Amen. And if you do that, the Lord will save you. I want to share what you what Romans 10 and verse number nine tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's God's plan of salvation right there, that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. The Bible tells us we should, we will be saved. Amen. All it takes is a simple prayer of salvation. Not a lot of words are required. A simple prayer such as what we have listed on the screen right now. Amen. Uh, we can, uh, you could come to the Lord and ask God to forgive you of your sin. And I, I'm not saying that you have to say these exact words, but this gives you an idea of how to come to God, how to pray and ask him to forgive you of your sin. And if you do that from a sincere heart today, God will hear and he will answer your prayer. Because again, we know, 
I've stated it over and over that God does not desire that any be lost, but that all would come to repentance. As you are looking at this prayer and as you are contemplating, I want to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus, Lord, just to thank you. Thank you for providing us with such a great salvation. Father, thank you for showing us the way that no one has to be lost. Father, I pray that you would touch the hearts and minds of people, those that are watching this video, and even those that are not watching, Father. But I just know it's your will that all be saved, so that those that are watching, I pray, Father, that you would give them the strength, the courage to pray the prayer of salvation today and to come and ask you to forgive them of their sins, Father, and to save them today, Father. I know if they pray that you will do it. And Father, I thank you again for what you have done for us, that you have provided salvation for us. And I thank you in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Once again, so um, happy that the Lord has provided this plan of salvation for us, that none of us have to be lost, that we could come to the Lord Jesus today. I also want to encourage you, whether you are a new uh, believer or whether you have been saved for a while, I want you to pray about um, finding a good church home. If you don't have a church home already, um, it's so important that we have a, a body of believers. First of all, a pastor, amen. And then a body of believers that we can worship the Lord with and that we could be supported. Amen. You know, in a lot of these lessons I'm seeing um, that God did not intend for us to be uh, lone rangers, alone. Amen. Even in today's lesson, we see some elements of that. When Naomi was going to go off by herself, how her daughter-in-law, Ruth, would not let her go alone. Amen. God, uh, he wants us to be able to have a body of believers that can support us, that can encourage us, that we can worship and that we can fellowship with. You know, the Bible tells us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together. And I believe there's a reason for that. Amen. And I just believe if we obey God, we do things his way. The Lord will bless us. I want to invite you to uh, the services at Mount Sinai. We have a wonderful time. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. And we um, just praise God in, in the service of the Lord. And you are more than welcome to worship with us on Sunday. If that's uh, a convenient choice for you, we would just be so delighted to have you worship with us. But now, if that's not a convenient choice, maybe it's just too far away. I know that if you pray and ask the Lord, he will lead, guide, and direct you to the church that he would have you to be in. Amen. I believe that's just a blessing in obeying God. And I know some people are concerned about uh, the church, amen, and concerned about the things going on in the church. But you know, God still has some true people out here. He has some true churches and some true people that really believe God and believe in what they're doing. Amen. And so I know if you pray, God will lead and guide and he will direct you again. Amen. Once again, I am so happy and I'm so delighted that you joined uh, up this time for this uh, week's uh, Sunday School Lesson Overview. And it was my prayer that you were blessed by the overview, that you got something out of that um, lesson a review that you can apply to your own life and that will be an encouragement to you as you uh, uh, continue your Christian walk and your Christian journey. Well, you know, you've seen the subject for next week's lesson. We're going to still be talking about Ruth. Amen. That's going to be a wonderful lesson. So if it's the Lord's will, if he delays his coming, we'll be right back next week with that lesson. And I would be so happy and delighted if you would tune in next week. I want to just quickly thank everyone um, who does watch. I, I really do appreciate it. And thank you for the kind comments and encouraging words. Amen. That you leave um, on uh, the video. I, I really do appreciate that. that that's so, so nice to have encouragement from fellow believers. Amen and amen. God bless you so much for that. 
Amen. As you encourage me, I want to encourage you in the Lord. Amen and amen. So again, we've seen next week's lesson. If the Lord delays is coming, we'll be back here next week. I pray that you will join me. But in the meantime, I pray that God will just cover and protect you and your family in your going out, in your coming in. I pray that God will keep you safe. I pray that God's peace, his love, and his joy abides in your household. That's my prayer for you. So until next week, God bless you and have a blessed week.